Hello and welcome back to Zero. No, String Zero. <laughs> I was about to get that wrong again. Um. So if you recall, which unfortunately I do not. Um, our protagonist, this guy, was having some issues deciding what he wanted to do with his future, I believe. So he decided to spend some time with his friend, quote unquote friend, uh, who's like this big tiger dude. And he's a jazz runner. I am not entirely sure what that means still. Um, they live in a very sort of advanced-ish society. I mean, you can see by this guy's holographic display thing, it's making him look kind of canine-y. Like, you can see the muzzle in front of his nose, the ears, something on the side of his face, and then, like, the tail behind him. Um... I don't really remember what it what they were talking about, though. Like, basically, he was trying to decide whether or not he was going to follow his friend and become a jazz runner himself. But then he was also talking about how his father and his... I don't want to call him nanny, because she wasn't a nanny. It was more like a bodyguard, I guess, for the father. Um, they had, like, other expectations for him, I think. Um... That's actually pretty much all of what I remember, unfortunately. I believe, though, that he is about to go into his father's bar or, like, his hotel or something, his establishment, to meet with a contact that is familiar with the, the type of work that he wants to do. Um, so he has to speak to them and eventually also speak to his father about his decision. So, yeah. That's pretty much all I remember, I think. So yeah, anyway, so um, I guess without further ado, let us begin String Zero. Arc 1, Winter's Jazz. Chapter 2, Jive. Heat, smoke, electrosax, the kaleidoscope of everything Sin Leo's is not. I squint, cough, and stick a finger in my ear all at once. We've lived out of the tails spinner's respite for several years now, but every time I return, it's like entering another louder world. I glance over my shoulder as the door slides shut, immediately feeling like I've trapped myself in a casket. I take a breath and shake my head. It's just family, Ravi. You're not dying. Moving forward, I pull off my gloves and let the sultry instrumental tones and warm beat soothe me. Ahead, the entrance vestibule opens up into a decorated waiting area, while a hallway to the side leads to the Grand Meridian Elevator and down to the underground metropolis of New Leos. There's a few people mingling there, dressed in electric and holographic finery. No doubt the hallway will be packed with a line of impatient patrons soon. I weave around a few chatty and decidedly more earthy sailors, and then step up to the long doorman's desk that bars entry, opulent and garish. A lot of the club is like that. Hey Jive. I lift a hand. Jive glances up from the holographic interface. It lights his granite face dimly. Middle-aged and handsome enough, he has one of those bodies made for bouncing sculpted stake hits. His deep voice is at once both rough and smooth, like rocks tumbled with sand. Oh, hey Ravi. Welcome back. His ears flick. I didn't expect you to return so soon. I fold my arms. Yeah, well, neither did I, honestly. I guess news of my spitting match with Dad got around alrighty. Hmm. You weren't quiet. He's not wrong. Yeah, yeah. My cheeks flush. He taps a few translucent buttons on the desk's specular security display and then gestures to my weapons. Give me just a minute, then we'll get you checked in. 
I lean over the desk a bit to see him organizing several columns of names. Elevator audit tonight? Hmm. I turn around. Preparing for the audit is always tedious. My eyes fall on one of the many holographic advertising displays lining the walls of the waiting area. Neon musicians sway with their instruments as alluring dancers swing provocatively. Some of the displays have menus, event calendars, and some... Welcome to Tailspinner's Respite, home of passion, peril, and pizzazz. Have dab. I shake my head. Want to make a deal or formalize a contract? Network in lavish surroundings with top tier performers? Come to the respite, where everyone is welcome. Sure, dad. May as well add, extort in luxury, bribe, blackmail, backstab. Or anything goes as long as it wears civility like a suit. I sigh and look instead towards the quickly growing crowd. Home sweet home. Turning back, I peek past Jive into the club proper to see wisps of perfumed smoke swirl from the bar towards the vaulted ceiling. The place isn't crowded yet, but the growing noise behind me suggests that that'll change soon. Actually, the place is even more vibrant than usual. Reflective silks and streamers hang from the hazy ceiling, illuminated by hidden lights to offer the impression of some kind of dripping, color-drenched dreamscape. Hmm. There's some big act tonight, Jive. He presses a few buttons to wrap up his work and nods, thumbing towards the stage. Sure is. Aaron managed to hire a jazz singer last minute. Barely got any promo vids or sound bites out in time. Jazz singer? No shit? Crazy. Never met one personally. I look past Jive again towards the stage, toggling my visor. I could have the interface linked directly with my visual cortex now, but that I don't need its thermal protection. But that wouldn't be stylish. The visor flashes and I check my loom to make sure that I am not forgetting anything important. The loom is like a sort of... Um... Dictionary? Uh, atlas? Almanac? Whatever you want to call it. That has like all the information about the visual novel when they, when they say something... It'll show up there in case you want to see what they're actually talking about. Singers are a rare breed, like Radiance users of the Shrad. Blah blah. Folks who can spin ambient jazz without the need for tech. I don't pretend to know anything about how jazz works without a technological medium. But if Dad hired a singer, that would explain all the extra color. In places like this where the jazz thickens with high emotion, they can tease it out to affect large audiences. Sonic narcotics or something. Hence the name, I guess. Morally dubious businessman 101 keep us stoned out of their gourds audience to distract it to stop buying drinks or tighten their lips. Dad's always on top of things. I'll give him that. Hey. Jive rests a thick elbow against the desk. The Sena fanaticism cafe. He taps the glossy wood. Weapons. I roll my eyes, but pull out my Radiance pistol from an interior jacket holster, as well as a folded up ultralight drone that I keep strapped to the small of my back. Mercifully, it wasn't crushed by Kavir's antics. I then disengage my visor. Fuck off. You just want to see Yuri's gun. Jive picks up the pistol and smiles at it longingly turning it over in his hand. Maybe I do. Its hilt is chaya wood, black, marbled blue, and flecked gold, while the slender barrel and the rest of the metal has an onyx luster attached to a compact energy cell. The whole thing is engraved with elegant vachin calligraphy. Mmm, beautiful. He activates the weapon. It hums as energy dimly swirls through the loops and hurls of metal. The man lifts the gun to chest height, reading. Would that every shot instead be a word, hence I speak only in hope for silence. And that I never be handled by unjust hands, lest the next word be our last. I nudge the barrel away from my torso. Do we need to have this ritual every time, Jiv? 
Is that Jiv or Jive? I'm gonna go with Jive. Well, you haven't taken the hint yet. Jive deactivates the pistol, its internal light fading. You know, my birthday's coming up. Not a chance. Yuri would actually kill me. It's probably Jiv, isn't it? God damn it. Okay, he's gonna be called Jiv from now on, I guess. Jiv laughs a subterranean sound. She most certainly would. He sets the pistol down, almost stroking it. If only Ration Order sidearms didn't have the bad habit of overloading and dying with their owners. Then there might be a few left for the rest of us. I wave off the comment. As if either of us could afford one. Then twirl a finger. Please stop trying to give my gun an orgasm and let's get on with it. Besides, aren't you retired? Why'd you even need it? His laugh fades to a chuckle. Ever heard of a collection? Sides, I'm retired, not dead. I can still shoot that deck off of your ear without grazing a hair. Now treat this baby with more respect, or I'm gonna make Uriel an offer that she can't refuse. Just you wait. I treat it with plenty of respect. I just don't kiss it every night before bed like you want me to do. Shh. He points to the gun. Don't be rude near the lady. She can hear you. I groan. He laughs again and waves a hand. Alright, alright, chill. A few taps to the console and the ceiling emits a pair of thin beams. One for the weapons and one for me, to verify any funky business is left to the musicians. So, about that singer. Are they here now? Anything special about this one? I look away. I read about them on patch notes not too long ago. Some net chatter about how not all of them are actually singers, and they can have pretty diverse abilities too. And then look back. You know, info the loom doesn't typically have. Oh, you a fan? Eh, more like professional interest. Jazz and all. Patch knows pointed to a brighter new story, so I dug around a little more. Something about disappearances and how performing seems like the only way to get patronage and protection. My ability isn't the same, but the similarities mentioned in the story were disconcerting enough. That's so. Well, can't say one way or another. Not had too much experience with them. All I know is that one looked the type fancy suit, flashy holographic bullshit. You didn't talk to them? Why would I? It's not my job to interrogate the talent. Especially with the backing this guy has. He's a jazz singer, Ravi. They're like trophies to the corpse. I've had enough company leashed cyberwolves chasing me for one lifetime. I'm not about to rock the boat. Like you said, I'm retired now. Jazz render emeritus or whatever. He tugs down on his vest. Respectable. That a fact. Or it could be the famous jazz runner, Jif Blasters lost his edge. Scared of a few coordinates agents, maybe. What'll the net say? Mr. Snow Thunder spooked. The desk groans as Jif leans his intimidating bulk against it. Now what Zamantin would go and say something foolish like that? I grin and lift my shoulders. Jif looks from me to his jazz reinforced claws, inspecting them. Tell me, Ravi, what do you think I'm here? You finally cave to that lifelong dream of bouncing? He clicks his tongue and waggles a finger. How about we count how many runners have reached their 60s in recent memory? He flicks my shoulder. Cal feels like a punch. One. He pauses, staring at his finger, as if mystified. Well, look at that. Just one. I rub my shoulder. Yeesh, it was a joke. He gently straightens the collar of my jacket. Shh. Knowing your limits is no joke, pup. You want to know the secret to 40 successful years of Merc Riff? Knowing when to walk away. So here I am, looking after the next generation of glory, hungry hot doggers. He looks at me pointedly. I continue rubbing my shoulder, glancing away as I clear my throat. 
No idea what you mean. I'm sure. Anyways, if you really want to know if that singer's got a unique flavor, go use the mouth of yours on his ego. Maybe you'll get lucky. I look back and suck my teeth, pointing to the gun. Don't be nasty, Jiv. The lady will hear you. He cracks a grin and then sweeps a hand over the console, wrapping up the scan. You're gonna get yourself shot one day, Ravi. I just haven't decided if it's gonna be from your mouth or your meddling. He shakes his head. Now let's get your smart ass inside. You're holding on my line. I glance over my shoulder and notice how a line has indeed started to snake behind me. The entryway is getting packed to. Must be this singer business. Jiv, meanwhile, steps over and gently pulls the coat from my shoulders. I'm wearing a red thermal Henley beneath, so my arms slide out easily. I idly wonder if the singer might know something about story time, about me. But Jiv is right about the risks. Even if the guy did, his corporal masters might find out that I was asking the wrong sorts of questions. And I have Kavir's contact to worry about anyways. Be discreet and listen. Hmm. That would certainly apply to meeting a celebrity jazz singer, but what business would Kavir have with someone that high profile? Jif knuckles my head as he walks away. What's this all about anyways? It's not like you to be starstruck. It's complicated. I gently jab his side. Maybe you can answer something for me though? He looks from the offending hand to my face, eyebrow lifted. The expensive hardware floors creak as he carries my gear into the storage room. Maybe I can. He hangs up my coat and then taps a few buttons to open a secure wall panel, folding my gun one last time. How dad managed to book a singer, especially at the last minute. Jiv snorts. Stupid question. I exhale and rub my forehead. Hmm. Dad keeps those kind of details close to his chest, even with us. Thankfully, Jiv is much more open. He hears a lot of chatter between his own fame and security duties. Maybe he'll throw me a bone. Fine. But I'm sure that you know something. Mm. He looks me up and down as he hands my gear off to some spider drones and then closes the panel. What if I do? Come on, don't be like that. You're really trying to sweet talk me like I'm some kind of diner waitress. Yes? I offer her my brightest grin. He shoots me a serious look. I'll give you this, but only because I'm real nice. Guy goes by crown. Heard about him here and there. Something about being an XPI. If he's got a deeper story than that, it's been pretty well buried. Whatever the case, he's patronized by the Alice now, so it's all tied up with the corporal family politics. But that's no surprise, so are all singers. You know the deal. Right. The joys of being leashed to the company. I tap my chin. That means trouble, Ravi. Hmm. Jiv gives me another thorough once over and then shakes his head. If you really want to talk to him, he'll be in the dressing rooms. But you'll want to be quick about it, because Aaron was complaining about needing to run over some last minute changes in the program with him. Could take a bit. He returns to the desk, meeting my eyes before keying some details into his console. I shift uncomfortably. Also, his patron's here. What? One of the aloes? Not one of. The aloe. The Secretary of Defense? He smugly folds his arms, eyes glinting. I, uh, I, I need to go. I hurriedly point towards the stage. He grins. I bet you do. And Ravi? I glance behind my shoulder as I quickly shuffle forward. Corpos are serious business. Whatever hot dogging nonsense you're up to, don't fuck it up. I nervously grin and finger gun at him before rushing towards the bar. I gotta figure out if this crown really is the right guy before he's inaccessible. But there's no getting down to the dressing room without passing Uriel at her usual station. I need to be slick. Whatever made Dad think 
that she was the ideal candidate for tending a bar still mystifies me, and yet... I spot the vulpine nun methodically wiping glasses. Dressed in her usual, if I must, minimalistic formal attire, she stands in imposing contrast to the allured atmosphere, like water crashing against foreboding cliffs. Captivating and treacherous. She effortlessly flips a polished glass in her hand, as if to judge its clarity, and then fluidly sets it down amongst the others. It's all martial efficiency, I know, but it's easy to mistake the expression of her hands for something else. Art, maybe. There's something between the challenge of her demeanor and the harmony of her actions. It draws people to her orbit. As I crouch to evade it and sneak by, her eyes flick up. Her fingers twitch. Ravi. Shit. I feign a stretch as I glance to the far end of the club and the backstage door. I could just book it and deal with the consequences later. Then I sigh. That kind of impulsiveness is exactly what got me in trouble with Dad this morning. Hopefully, Crown stays free for a little longer. Yuri? I smile and slide onto one of the bar's high stools. You came back? She looks at me, towards the stage, then back to her work. I clear my throat. I had some time to cool off. With Kavir, no doubt. My booted foot nervously taps on one of the stool legs. Maybe. Why? Don't be so nosy. Then control your foot. She re retrieves a new glass to polish. And don't blush. I step on my own foot as I feel my face heat up. I frown and quickly try to rub it away. I was literally just outside. It's the cold, not whatever you're thinking. I hate this woman sometimes. Corden's shades hold nothing to whatever this mystic sense that she's got. Since you have the time to lie to yourself, assist me. She slides two glasses across a bar and tosses me a rag. I seriously consider throwing it back in her face. Fine, I just know that I can see what you're doing. I waggle the rag at her preparing some misguided attempt to work me through being irritated with Dad, right? She usually tries to play mediator between us in her own way. We can skip it. I do have more important tasks than indulging paternal drama, so feel however you like. Good, I'm in a hurry. She gestures with her head towards the remaining glassware. Besides, as you evangelize your ability so well this morning, I have faith in your ability to multitask. Be irritated whilst you polish. I opened my mouth to respond, but then close it peevishly. Fine. I lift the glass and start polishing with rough, annoyed strokes. She watches my movements with displeasure. The music fills our silence as we stare each other down. What do you have against Kavir anyways, really? Like you, he is impulsive. It's not fair. You could just as easily call him brave. Reckless. I roll my eyes. Must everything be a sparring match? Decisive. She stopped wiping the glass. Foolish. I lean forward. Daring. Tactless. Sincere. Charming. Ha Wait. You think he's charming? Yuri sighs as she finally sets down her towel. I'm not lying, child. Yes, he's charming, but he's also indiscreet. He'll be guile you and then ten other men he's courting right into trouble. Likely with each other. If you're looking for security, you won't find it with him. She snatches up her towel and tosses it, turning to rearrange some bottles. If bruises aren't on the table, she organizes when she's upset. I understand what she's getting at. My relationship with Kavir has always been too ambiguous for her liking. It works for us, though. He supported me today, after all. Anyways, it's none of her business. Beguile? Courting? Yuri, you know you're out of your touch, but I'm not some child prince. He's my best friend. I elbow lean against the bar and stage whisper. I know all about how he gets around. Besides... I smirk. Don't you understand the art of the flirt? She glances over her shoulder and narrows her eyes. 
no. I look away, my stool creaks. Well, Dad certainly knows all about it. She grunts at her bottles. Got her. You would do well to take after your father in that regard as little as possible. I finish polishing and slide a glass towards her. She catches it without turning. Yeah, well, one problematic quality of many. You remember the whole don't call me dad anymore bit earlier, right? I do. She stacks the first glass and gestures for the second. I don't give it to her yet. What do you think? How irritating for you. I lift both glass and towel in a helpless gesture. Well, I'm sorry you had to witness that. He just made me stupidly angry. I felt like a kid again, storming out into the damn mint fields. Yuri looks to the side and regards a glass of water filled with thin blue-green stalks bushy with small textured leaves and tiny blue-white flowers like ice in powdered snow. Himament for the drinks. She starts to reach for one, but then pauses. I can't pretend to be party to his thoughts, but I do know he loves you. She plucks one, rolling the thin stalks between her fingers. If connections exist without pain or consequence, we wouldn't value them nearly as much. She turns, keeping her eyes on the spinning leaves before eventually setting it down. But sometimes, we still need the reminder that they matter. Our eyes meet as she similarly attempts to pluck the glass from my hand. I smile, and promptly toss my towel at her face. Naturally, she catches it. I'll be okay. I worked out all my anger already. Mostly. I just... I feel a little ridiculous is all having been that torn up about it. Yuri sets down the towel and then reaches out to warmly squeeze my wrist. Vulnerability isn't weakness, child. You express yourself honestly. There is value in that. I shift in my seat and turn towards the stage. Did I? Value in being explosive and easily read? I guess. Perhaps. There's nothing inherently good or bad about anger. It's simply is. People are starting to fill in now, so Jiv must be working through the line. I really should get going, but something keeps me stuck. Guilt, maybe. She looks towards the stage as well, probably to see if she can find whatever it is that's bothering me. Good luck. What you need is to learn more control. We could always restart medit- We both know how that ended last time. I don't want to be punched for falling asleep. I set down the glass and slide it towards her, far side, knowing that she'll have to release my wrist to catch it. She does. Then don't complain about lacking discipline. I pull my hand back and rub it. She pulls back to turn and stack the glass. We both take a breath. Thanks for being terrible at emotional support. If that's what it takes to challenge and prepare you. Prepare me for what? I fold my arms. Does that mean if I meet your militant standards, you're not opposed to me leaving, getting my own place? Taking more dangerous jobs? Yuri opens her mouth to speak, but her serious expression quickly turns withering as one of the gathering patrons begins to approach. The woman is dressed in a smart suit coat with a holographic miniskirt covering her legs. The cyberware in her neck and face is aesthetically concealed, the kind of hardware only corpos can afford. Yuri seems to get that impression as well. Excuse me. The woman clears her throat. <clears throat> My apologies for the interruption, but the secretary, Tarov, just requested a drink to be prepared for him once his business with the proprietor concludes. Shit, I checked the time on my display. Has it been that long? Hopefully he's keeping Dad busy. He said to make it one of your esteemed homeland specials. Her left eye flashes and then projects a credit tabulation, which she then flicks towards the bar's glowing payment receiver. I'm pretty sure that I see an extra digit beyond our normal prices before the visual dissolves. Yuri's expression does not warm as she checks the payment. I'll endeavor not to poison him. She waves the woman off. The attendant, however, looks unnerved. While he did joke that you say something to that effect, you just can't leave. 
Yuri turns back to me as the attendant looks uncomfortable between us, and then spins on her heel rather than engage Yuri further. I can't blame her, honestly. I'm already halfway off my stool to rush downstairs, but something about the whole exchange bothers me. Esteemed Homeland Special? A debased cocktail, it uses blood of the mother, a sacred Bachin funerary wine. Every batch includes a drop of blood from a fallen Ration warrior. Oh. Fuck. I isn't that shit, like, illegal? Luxury items aren't part of the embargo. Your father feels obligated to keep a bottle around to satisfy perverse tastes. She sets her jaw. This is precisely why I worry, Ravi. The city has no love for us. If you leave, I won't be around to protect you. I deflate a bit. But haven't I proven that I can take care of myself? Against ordinary problems, yes. Well, that's something. Then what's an extraordinary problem? I can't possibly prepare you for every danger the city has to offer. Come on, Yuri. Even you can't protect me from the constant unknown. Isn't the whole point of living to experience a little risk? Hmm. What? You sound like your father. Is that even a compliment? No. Wow. I love you too. The fight suddenly drains out of her. She picks up the sprig of mint from before, pinching it between her index and forefinger. For a moment, those foreboding cliffs look motherly. I know. I realize I'm fully off my stool and anxiously tapping the bar. I stop. In a hurry? No. Ugh. Yes. It's fine. Go talk to your father. She pauses for a moment, looking me over thoughtfully. Now I really feel guilty. <sighs> I must sometimes remind myself that there are no correct journeys. No truly defined paths. Only choices. She holds the mint up to her nose, inhaling slowly and then gestures towards the backstage door, as if she has entirely figured me out. It's not my place to take those from you. Quoting from scripture again? No. Ravi? Yeah? Just know that if you ever truly need me... She holds out the little sprig, green leaves veined with blue. I will find you. Her glove fingers touches mine as I pluck the sprig from her fingers. Its aroma is cool and fresh. I know. I jog away, nervously rolling the stem between my fingers. There's no time to reflect on my guilt or give Yuri's commentary much thought as I weave around table and talk to reach the backstage door. The music's volume halves the moment the door shuts. I hurry down the flight of stairs into the basement. Thankfully, the dressing rooms aren't far off the stage. I should make it just in time. Isn't a request, Aaron. I immediately flatten myself against the wall. Damn it, I don't need to be running into dad right now. I better not have fucked this up. I fumble with my pants pocket for a moment, dumbly trying to stow the mint without crushing it. I ended up sliding it into my hair before slowly peeking around the corner. The closed doors of the dressing room line the long hallway. Dad and two well-dressed darwolves are standing in front of this celebrity suite. Crown's suite. Great. It won't be too much long before he performs, going by our normal schedule. How do I get these jokers to move? I doubt Wei Ling Crown in the hallway on his way to the stage is going to earn me points, especially if he's not the right guy. Damn. Any time alone with him. The larger of the two men loom over Dad. His expression threads the line between seductive and menacing. Deep growling echoes down the hall. Need I remind you that your family's professional citizenship exists only because I find you amusing. And while I do enjoy seeing you squirm, everyone has their own master to answer to. He leans his muzzle so close that I'm sure Dad can smell his breath. I can barely hear him rumble. I need results, Aaron. Results? I feel like I'm about to tip over, craning to hear. 
I'm going to get caught if I keep poking my head like an idiot. I shimmy further back and tap my earpiece to summon my visor. Doing so allows me to call up our security protocols and holographic display and accesses closed circuit camera feeds pointed at the hallway. Patched into the system, I direct the sensors at the conversating men until I can see and hear them clearly without painting a target on my head. I can think and eavesdrop. Thank you very much, Yuri. You misunderstand me, Tarif. No need for threats. I am simply asking questions, not giving excuses. Tarolf? Aloras Tarolf? Secretary Creepy Drink? I rub my face and try not to groan. As if Dad being here wasn't bad enough. If Kavir knew that I'd have to get through this fucking Secretary of Defense, I'm going to beat him up. I live for the Chairman's pleasure, of course. Of course. He pulls back a little. It would indeed be a shame for our profitable arrangement to sour. The information you provide continues to prove quite useful, and I've found I do genuinely enjoy your diversions on occasion. Only on occasion? Tarif, I am hurt. Keep delivering, and that will be the extent of my pain. Without warning, Tarif quickly steps forward crowding Dad's space and forcing him back against the wall. What follows is barely audible. Unless I decide you want it. Ew. But Dad seems unfazed, reaching out to pat the wolfman's large shoulder. The man behind Tarif appears uncomfortable. Bodyguard, maybe? What's this all about, Dad? I will gladly listen to you enumerate your preferred debasements, Tarif. He briefly nods to the other man and then looks back to the wolf in front of him with raised brows. In private? Tarov chuckles. The two men are still very close. Blech. I take a moment to pull up the floor's electrical schematics. Maybe if I blow a light or trip an alarm, they'll fucking move? I simply require more details. I was not in fact resisting the order. I remain, as always, fully committed to the chairman's service. Chairman this, chairman that. I'd hate to think you're simply using me to warm into the chairman's good graces. Perhaps slip in a wedge of doubt or a seed of malcontent? He leans down, his teeth almost grazing Dad's ear. I like you. Arv Arvaran? You're slippery. A challenge to catch and chew. Then he pulls back, thumbing a fang. But take care not to be too challenging. I have a propensity for breaking toys that don't play by my rules. Dad doesn't flinch, which surprises me. I'm sure he didn't enjoy having his story name covered in slime. I shall strive to be only moderately stimulating. You do that. Tarof motions over to the man behind him. He's similar to Tarof, except the other guy's wearing an agent's suit and is way more cybered out. His eyes look like some kind of fancy Yolong model, but without the usual coordinates shades. I doubt he's noticed me yet. This is taking too damn long, and I don't want to fuck with an agent. Ugh. I swipe away the electronical schematics and offer something more direct, typing Dad a message. Hey, can we talk in my room? I believe you've met my son, Agent Allo... Allo... Da... Allo... Dama... Allo... Damarek? Yikes, two aloes? These are the big shits, the real stinkers, and the chairman's toilet. But if it does come down to talking my way in, Tarov I can manage. He seems more like a talker than a fighter, or Dad wouldn't be indulging him. Talkers I can handle. I zoom in, looking at you, Dad. Of course. He checks our guest's audits periodically. Good evening, Derek. Read your damn pad, Za Zamatan. 
I reset the feed. The younger of the wolfmen doesn't look dad in the eyes at first, instead giving him a slow once-over, like he's running some kind of analysis. Then he nods stiffly. Mr. Aaron? This guy's likely to be a problem. Agents are dangerous even without their toys. Probably some kind of biometric sensor to detect lies. I'm glad that I didn't trip an alarm. He'd probably go into nasty bodyguard mode. Marvelous. Derek, give the man his details. There is a hesitation, much like with the attendant earlier. Derek's left eye eventually flashes and projects a data stream, which he flicks towards Dad. A beep issues from Dad's pocket, from which he retrieves a miniature pad that projects an expanded holographic dossier. He's never been one for the neural interfaces. Someone might steal my thoughts. He swipes through the data twice before waving away the information, pausing briefly to check something on the pad's physical screen. An indicator flashes on my display. Message read. Bless Ren receipts. Now move. I'll review this fully later. Would you kindly summarize? Bitch, are you leaving me on read? Derek flexes in augmented hand. Another hesitation. As father mentioned, we've just recently retrieved some information from the ancient laboratories beneath the company Ar Arcology? Dad lifts a brow. So do I. Indeed, I was under the impression the structure had been fully mined of its usefulness long ago. The accessible portions, yes, but the structure's subterrane is quite extensive and parts of it remain obscured and unexplored. We periodically recover and restore what we can. Fascinating. The information must be quite valuable then. He taps the pad against his open hand. I imagine the more sensitive details have been omitted from the dossier? Naturally. Derek nods again. All I'm permitted to say is that the data has revealed a particular location of interest, hence the request. Certainly the chairman has the resources to mount an expedition without my assistance? Of course, but even the chairman has rivals and is watched closely. It would be best to employ an informed but clandestine third party. However dubious. He offers Dad a knowing look. Are you implying that I am some sort of spy? Derek glances around the hallway and then to his father. Tariff smirks. Is a subterfuge and misdirection truly necessary? We know what he is. Dad presses a hand to his chest. Derek, is this what you truly think of me? He tucks with a shake of his head and then rests the pad against his chin. Ah, uh, but fair, Tariff. I do have more secure accommodations for sensitive discussion than a hallway. He holds out a finger. For my patrons, of course. Oh, thank Cal. Now leave. Derek is rubbing his eyes, annoyed, while Tariff sighs and pulls back his sleeve to check an antique timepiece set on a golden band. He moves to tap it, but something there catches his attention. A sudden turn towards the wall and its hidden camera. A small head tilt and his nose in the air. I glance down the hallway. Another smirk. Oh, I'm certain news of the discovery will leak quite soon. My blood freezes. Both Dad and Derek look at the man. So, discretion makes little difference. Without the location's coordinates, however, there's nothing anyone can do about it. And those are extremely well secured, of course. As is anyone with knowledge of them. He smiles in a way that broadly shows his fangs, either to the camera or Dad. I can't tell, and then smooths out his sleeve. I try to melt into the wall, my heart pumping. No way, man. Alarms scream in my head. I should bug out. Fuck. I almost bang a fist against the wall. So for the foreseeable future, at least, all interested parties will be forced to bide their time while we arrange our little affair. 
Speaking of which, Derek is opposed to your involvement and has made something of a pastime out of collecting information about your life story. Wait, information about Dad? This is too important to bug out now. Focus, I need the surveillance on Derek. Father. Tariff shrugs. You did ask to drop the subterfuge. Besides, you must realize that he already knows. Really, Taraf, must we always play this game? I'm no more a spy than Derek is an anarchist dissident. I am a loyal agent of the chairman. Dad waves a hand. Point being that I am afraid that you're allowing your imagination to run away with you. And what exactly is a likelihood a poor outcast from the Shrad manages to work their way up to running one of the most celebrated clubs in the city? Becoming so exceptionally well-connected? He gestures to his father. Having personal meetings with the Secretary of Defense? During a Cold War? I narrow my eyes. He's not wrong. Dad's never been entirely forthcoming about his work. Dad turns to Tarov. You never mentioned he was a fan. He turns back to Derek. Perhaps I'm simply an immigrant who worked very hard and got a little lucky. Tarov snorts. Derek ignores him, staring Dad down in a way that suggests that he does in fact have some kind of lie detector. Simply? With a personal ration warrior nun? Aaron waggles his finger. An outcast ration warrior nun. Is there truly something so strange about outcasts finding each other and banding together? Two outcasts of your collective talents? Yes. Dad always said that he knew Yuri before her exile. Is he just playing this guy? Flatterer. But on the contrary, wouldn't you say competence attracts competence? So, you're what then? An outcast spy? I never said I was either. Besides, how could I possibly be both? Double agent. You must truly think very highly of me to presume that I can manage a club, a vast network of contacts while spying and being a father. Uh, I know you liked me. I rub my temple, uncomfortable with the sudden feeling that I might have a flawed understanding of my own history. And they still haven't moved. I'm getting more and more anxious. Did Tarov bring this up just for my sake? To mess with Aaron? Both? Tarov pats his son's shoulder. You can stop scanning him. Called it. I warned you not to indulge in dissembling. There's little point. He has an astounding talent for filling the air with empty words. Derek grunts unpleasantly, but does seem to relent. Besides, I think that we can all agree the consequences of playing multiple loyalties would be dire. Especially when one has so much to lose. I'm sure that I don't know what you mean. Of course you don't. He grips Dad's shoulder, the points of his claws denting the cloth. One would need to be extremely subtle after all. Flawless. For the first time, Dad looks genuinely uncomfortable. I don't appreciate the implication. Relax. He releases his hand, stretching out his claws in clear view of Dad's face, as if checking them for dirt. Then he wipes aside on one of Dad's bearded cheeks. If I have reason to believe you are going to double-cross me, these claws wouldn't be so clean. Dad frowns. Something Tarov said must have really caught him off guard for his usual mask of casual levity to falter twice. Do your part and coordinate with Derek, and everything will be fine. He'll accompany your group as insurance. For all of us. Derek suddenly reaches out to rest a hand on his father's arm, guiding it away from Dad's face. The elder Aloe laughs, and then pats the younger's hand with his own. Father, enough. I'll handle him on my own way. I have my orders. Still chuckling, Tarov suddenly squeezes Derek's hand a little too tightly and rushes it away. 
now free, Tarif considers his son with a chilling grin. Do you now? Derek shoots his father a warning look. Mr. Aaron. The wolf's eyes remain locked. Yes. It takes a moment for Derek to chance turning his eyes away from Tarof. My distrust aside, if you keep me veritably appraised of all your activities, I'll have no reason to hinder your work or preparations. I'll even see that you are assisted should I feel comfortable that you're working in the chairman's best interest. His tone darkens. And have nothing to hide. Dad rediscovers his fake smile. My dear Derek, everyone has something to hide. Though I doubt you'd be interested in my indulgent collection of bad poetry. Be that as it may, Derek is absolutely right. Someone should keep an eye on you and your poetry. The Elder Wolf slides an arm around his son's shoulder with all the companionship of Boiling Storm. Consider it in order to stay here until the expedition is prepared. Son. And try to use the extra time to loosen up that stick up your ass. What? Father, I don't think... Derek. His arms tighten. Derek suddenly snarls and pushes the arm away, staring back in challenge. I don't report to you. Father. A growled series of dared rumbles between them. Fangs and snarls flash in answer. The very air seems to crackle, threatening to ignite. Dad clears his throat. And then, like clearing skies, Derek suddenly seems to remember himself and relents, glumly turning away. Yes, sir. With equal alacrity, Tarot's demeanor likewise shifts. Good lad. I'll work things out with Director Hadil tomorrow. He'll be furious. Not your concern. Focus your attention here. I also have the chairman's best interest in mind, after all. Hadil will see the wisdom in this, just as you did. I'll make sure of it. Tarolf pats his shoulder and then leans in to whisper something my feed doesn't pick up. Ugh, that's probably my cues. They probably won't move anytime soon. And I'm starting to feel like I might have judged these wolves all wrong. Best not to prove a jiv right and get my ass shot. I quickly pull up the club's security protocols. I've created a little breeding function some times ago for Dad to snoop over video feeds in his downtime. I'll run that and then scram. Figure out some other way to getting to crown. Okay, let's just close out of... The security feed shows Tariff about to round the corner. Fuck. I quickly shut off my visor and practically stumble over myself as I push off from the wall. My, my. He's dropping on a company secretary. You really are your father's son. I freeze. Ravayan, yes? I don't... Shh. He holds a finger to his muzzle. Think real hard on what you're about to say. Cow. Damn it. I swallow hard. I mean, it's Ravi. Uh, how do you know? Good lad. To answer your question, you have a similar scent and a strikingly similar look as well. I'd wager you could pass as your father at the same age. Though you might be more handsome. The man extends his paw like hand. No. Excuse me? I meant my name. Ah, yes. The Ryan story names. Well, it is my business to know all about our adversaries. I do oversee Leosian intelligence, after all. As I understand it, they are your true names, yes. Your person stripped of all falsehoods and artifice. Noble names like mine. He looks from me to his paw and back again. He's still smiling. Now, don't be rude. I want to yell at him that Ryan didn't join Shrad Haswar willingly. That he's got story names all wrong. That they will never fit right in his mouth. But I'm trapped. So I wrap my fingers around his and try to smile. 
His paw is huge. My whole hand could fit inside his palm. But the shake is gentler than I expected. There. Not so hard. Hmm. I'm sure you've heard already. But for formality's sake, um... Allo... Allo Rastaralf. My true name. He keeps my hand in his even after the handshake finishes. Though, Taralf is fine in a pedestrian setting like this. Asshole, the respite is far from pedestrian. And I'm getting sick of feeling his paw around my hand. I feel myself glaring without meaning to. Dad would be hurt to hear you say that. His grin widens. Suddenly my body lurches forward. My arm has been lifted above my head and my knuckles are being squeezed so hard that I gasp. I'm anxious from his chest. I can feel his breath on my hair. His other arm wraps around my shoulder, pinning me to him. His bulk feels like Kavir's, but he's snarling. And I wonder how hurt Arrow would be if something happened to you. He twists my palm around, pressing down and back. My heels come off the floor. I've been in this exact hold countless times, sparring. But it doesn't matter. The only result of years and years of combat training is that I manage not to scream. I push uselessly with my free arm. There's no way out of the hold. His massive paw is holding me still while he bends my crushed wrist further and further. I gasp for air like I'm drowning. How hurt might Uriel be? I hear her telling me to focus, but I can't. His thumb is bending something that shouldn't be bent. It's about to snap. I brace myself. Then he releases my wrist. I wrench it to my chest, trying to catch my breath. My hand feels like it's been run over by a steamroller. While I cradle my bruised knuckles, my paw around my shoulder slides down to the small of my back. It's warm, even through my shirt. He pulls me forward. Did you even consider how this little exercise might end? My stomach turns. I'm paralyzed. I can't respond. All I can think about is my hand throbbing. I feel him staring down at me. Smiling. His voice softens. You've entered a dangerous game, Ravi. He dips down so that we're eye to eye. I don't dare look away. He takes my injured hand and lifts it up so that we can both see it. Three of the knuckles are already purple. It hurts to move my fingers. He turns it over delicately in his paw, examining it like a piece of fine jewelry. But then he looks at me again. I feel like I'm going to vomit. And now, I can't help but wonder, how will you play? The same as your father? Dad. I feel it suddenly bubble out of me, a surge of anger, a clarion call of all of Dad's lies and missteps. No. Clarity through pain. Get it together, Ravi. Observe. I can hear his nostrils taking in my scent, his tongue working over a fang. Consider. He's waiting for something, goading me. I don't know what he's after, but being intractable seemed to work for Dad. I can get out of this. Execute. We're not the same. I push my foot forward into one of Yuri's stances and lower my center of gravity. The twist inside of his pull is a little too forceful and I stumble, but the motion does free me from his grasp. Or he lets me go. I can't tell. Amusing. A small observation. You're not as different as you think. You certainly don't have his finesse, but you've got his spunk. He strains his sleeves and then smooths down his shirt. Fortuitous for you, as I can always use more. Mutually rewarding relationships with capable men. So I'm willing to look past this little incident if you agree to a few small conditions. Here's how this is going to work. First, best if you don't mention this to your father. Oh, don't fret about anything you heard. Harmless. Your father does enjoy a good verbal sparring, as I am sure you know. Sometimes, he just needs a reminder of who makes the rules. Second, are you two fucking? I blurted out. I'm still breathing hard, 
favoring my bruised hand. All impulse control gone. The wolf's brow lifts in an unadulterated surprise. The following laughter echoes like an avalanche down the hallway. I, I beg your pardon? It's a simple question. And a presumptuous one. The gall in you. I can just ask a dad. And how do you think that will go? Damn them both. I am not an unreasonable man, Ravi. If you want answers, I'll gladly provide them, once they've been earned. Which leads us to my second condition. One day, and one day soon, I'm going to contact you, and you're going to answer. He holds up a finger before I can protest. I just want you to take the call, Ravi. I am not demanding that you agree to anything else. Simply, regardless of where you are, whatever you're doing, you will answer. And third, you're going to tell me why you are lurking over here. See? Small conditions. Small? You almost broke my damn fingers. Indeed. Almost. Nothing a simple analgesic gel wouldn't remedy. A small lesson to be mindful where you point your cameras. I shoot him a hard, seething look. How did he know? He smiles back. So, if I don't agree, what, you'll beat me up? He chuckles. Nothing so coarse. He gestures from me to the wall. It would be a shame to have you arrested for espionage, but I do take my position very seriously. I can feel the sticky heat of my sweat. That's the very last thing that I need. Fine, I get it. So, you're really not worried about anything I heard? You are very interrogative for a young man in such a precarious position. But as I said earlier, it doesn't really matter. Fortunately for you. He holds out his hand. His left hand this time. I eye it warily. Do you agree to my conditions? I look between my wounded hand and his. Much as before, I don't really see any other option. We shake. Excellent. Now. He spreads his arms wide. Why risk this? I... I wanted to meet Crown. You're serious. And Dad isn't the most forthcoming about the shit that he gets up to, so... Ah, so when you heard us talking, you got curious. Yeah. Tarov shakes his head. Aaron really should have raised you with a little more impulse control. Yuri tried, at least. Well, allow me at least to make all this trouble worthwhile. A gesture of good faith, if you will. Come, I'll introduce you to Crown. Oh, great. I hope that I look starstruck instead of mortified. A sweep of his arm invites me to lead us down the hallway. I step around the corner and walk a bit like I'm being force-marched to an execution. At least I'm getting to Crown even if it's in the absolute worst way possible. He better be the right guy. Dad and Derek appear to be gone, having moved into the living quarters just a way down, probably, so we quickly find ourselves at Crown's dressing room door. Tarov makes to wrap his knuckles against it, but then pauses. Why do you want to meet Crown? He is a challenging man. Not nearly so congenial as myself. When he smiles, I can't help but feel like it's the same expression that he uses to regard a good cut of meat. I decide to use the same line that I use with Jiv. Professional interest? I've never met a jazz singer. I work with jazz all the time in the cyberware that I build, so the idea someone can just make that shit work without gear is... Fascinating. I nod. So does he. Apparently the announcement is just a courtesy as Tarov immediately opens a wooden door. So that's where I'm going to leave it for today. So, we got to meet a pair of well, three new characters. We met Jiv. I think that's how it's pronounced. I googled it and Google said it's Jiv. Um, then again, it was referring to a type of clothing, so eh. Um, 
pretty interesting looking character. Um, had a talk with them. Also had a talk with Uriel. And both seem to have like the same... Um, uh, like they kind of want to impress upon... Um, to this guy here. That what he's doing is... That seems very impulsive and kind of like a bad idea. Um, like, yeah, jazz runners. Ooh, nice, fancy. Like, oh, look, it's really cool. You get to go out and explore and find stuff and whatever. But chances are you'll, you know, you'll die young. Um, and apparently only one has made it to what, what was it, their 60s? And Uriel goes on further to say that they feel that the only reason he's doing it is because he wants to be with the tiger dude I forgot his name already uh, by, by now you're used to me forgetting names but like um and it kind of seems that way like he's only really doing it because he wants to be closer to this other person like yeah he wants to go out and experience life but at the same time it's very um it seems very like like he's doing it specifically because he wants to do it with this person with you know the tiger from the previous you know the previous video um that's kind of what i get at least and then also the two other characters uh who were speaking with his father um they're what were they called uh something wolf the aloe well the family aloe um really really long names unfortunately i already forgot his name oh Ta tarolf tarolf the big one and derek the other one the son um i kind of get that Tarolf is corrupt, like obviously corrupt uh, politician, um, secretary of defense, and a whole bunch of other things. And he's using his father in order to, I guess, get information, because uh, apparently a lot of people come to this this place and i guess it's like the perfect place to fish for information you know be sneaky and get information from unsuspecting people and then invite other people who apparently can put you in a trance and then lower your inhibition so you can spill the beans more i guess um that, that's kind of what i got about the whole like um singers um a lot of shady things go on in this whole this this establishment. Um, I also got the sense that although the son is not particularly fond of his father's tactics, he will still go along with it to a certain extent. By the son, I mean Derek. Uh, by the father, I mean Tarf. Um, yeah. I mean, it was very, it was very stupid of this guy in order to be, to basically be eavesdropping and then literally stay there. I mean, if you're able to use the cameras in order to eavesdrop on these people, you might as well just leave. Go, go somewhere else and eavesdrop from a safer place. But obviously, I, I don't know. This guy is very impulsive, but that's kind of part of the course for a lot of visual novel protagonists, very impulsive and getting themselves into situations that they shouldn't be in. Anyways, but yeah, so write down in the comments what you think, and thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play String Zero yourself, you can do so by going down into the link in the description for the Blue Sky and the Twitter page, which should have direct links to the itch.io page where you can download the game, or you can just go to itch.io and download it yourself. And they also have a Patreon, so in case you want to support the project, you can do so by going down into the link in the description and, you know, subscribing there and supporting them, which should get you early access to build of String Zero. 
and whatever else they might offer. And also they have Discord, so if you want to join their Discord, then you can do so by, you know, looking for it. It should be in the Twitter or the Blue Sky page, probably. I don't know. Or maybe the Edge.io page, probably. Anyway, so I guess that's it for now, and I will see you guys in the next part. Bye-bye.